do for this week, we're going to talk about outliers. So now that we've got our complete data set of cases we can impute, we might be interested in looking at participants who just don't fit with the rest of the data. So the definition of an outlier is an extreme value on one or multiple variables. And so potentially these occur for a couple of reasons. It could be data imputation error. So you accidentally left in that 2000 instead of fixing it in your accuracy step. But now you know how to back up, fix it, rerun all this. A mindless participant. So there are a lot of reasons, and I'm a social scientist, so we deal a lot with freshmen. And <laughs> there are a lot of reasons that the data could just be clicked through. Your survey is boring. They're just doing it because they have to. Um, Participants who want to get paid, like say on Mechanical Turk, uh, are trying to do it as fast as possible because you know the faster you get it done, the faster you get paid. So there are lots of ways that participants are mindless that don't necessarily mean that they're brainless. They just aren't taking it seriously or they aren't really the data you're interested in because if they didn't have time to read the question, why would I want to infer something from that data? or they could truly be an outlier. So we see this a lot with, with scales measuring, let's say depression, anxiety, stress, or we have people who are truly that anxious or that stressed. And they're an outlier in our sample because um, we're trying to get, you know, sort of normal range and they're way outside normal. So that's not the population maybe I'm intending to sample. And so sometimes these populations are called with, where they have long tails there's truly a skewed distribution with a really long tail. Um, and maybe you're not interested in including someone who's way out on the edges. Um, and so not from the population I meant to sample could be, uh, let's say they are, um, you're trying to just calculate normal distributions and they're way outside of normal, but, or it's a distribution with a really long tail. These, these two are kind of very similar points on the last point here. So either way, outliers can have a strong impact on a statistical analysis because many of our statistical analyses use mean as a model and the mean is heavily impacted by outliers. And so one consideration we could do is just change our analysis to using the median as a model. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. So the logic of removing them is that well, one of the things we just said that most statistics that we'll do in this course focus on mean as a model of the data and the mean is heavily affected by outliers. And so we'll just make sure that we use our really strict criterion that we talked about at the beginning of this video to only remove very extreme scores. So there are basic two basic types. They can be a univariate outlier, meaning that they're an outlier only on one of the variables. So just that one dependent variable and um, there's one column of data to really do this on and that's the only thing they're an outlier on. Okay. And so we can use Z scores, that scale standardized score with our alpha of 0.001, our, our strict criterion to eliminate these people. Okay. And so this is like if everyone made a somewhere between 80 and 90 on a test, and one participant made a 10. Okay, their scores are gonna be way far out from everybody else's. And so the alpha of 0.001 sort of corresponds, it's very close, corresponds to a Z score of three. It's actually, I think it's a little higher than three actually, but most people use this like three criterion. If they're three standard deviations away from the mean, they are way out there and let's exclude them. And that's useful when you only have one column of data to check. But in our case, we've got like 20. So what do we do then? Okay. And those are multivariate outliers. So when I have multiple continuous variables, they do have to be continuous. Um, I can check them all at once. So instead of checking each every individual single column and deleting them when they're an outlier on that column, which is a possibility, but a lot of work, we could figure out how far away they are from the mean using multiple columns. So remember the z-score is what they do is they measure how far away from the mean something is. Okay, and this is many lectures ago at this point, but the idea behind a z-score is that a zero z-score means that your score is right on average. Okay. 
A three means you're three standard deviations away from the mean and you're very far out in the tails. That's easy enough when I have one column of data. The formula is x minus each person minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Cool. What do I do when I have a lot of columns of data? So we're going to use what's called Mahalanobis distance. It's a fun Scrabble word, right? That creates a measure of distance from the centroid. Okay, the centroid is the mean of all the means. So it figures out the mean of the means and plots how far each participant is from that middle of middles. So I like to think about this as football fields because I'm a big sports fan. And so the middle of the middle might be the very center of the stadium in the 50 yard line, you know, right on that center point. Okay. And you can plot how far away every person is from that point in sort of 3D space. Now, Mahalanobis distance does this in multi-D space, but you know, if you've got seats up in the up in the press box, you're very far away than the people who are right on that right on that front row. And the issue then becomes that there's no one rule. So for Z scores, it's always three, right? People will pick three. I mean, you can pick a different rule, but it's based on a Z score distribution. It doesn't matter how many columns there are because there's only ever one column. But in our Mahalanobis scores, because sometimes there's four columns and sometimes there's 40 columns, we have to change the rule based on the number of columns. Because if you think about it, the more columns you have, the more you can vary from other people. So we're gonna adjust our criterion based on the number of input points. So the way that Mahalanobis distance works, it's distributed in a chi-square distribution. Okay, we have our normal distribution, right? It's kind of symmetric, nice bell-shaped curve. Chi-square distribution is related to this, but it's also squared. So fold that in half. It's not, it's not exactly like that, but let's just pretend for a second, fold it in half. And so that means all of our values are positive. Okay, and the chi-square distribution work, like matches onto this idea of distance quite well because most of the values are close to zero. Okay, so the distribution peaks closer to zero with only a few values that are very far away. So we're gonna look for where very far away values are and count those as outliers. And so anytime you have something that's measured in distance where it doesn't tend, it doesn't have negative values. Okay. Um, Chi-square tends to be the distribution that matches that best okay. versus normal because a normal distribution has negative values in a z-score. Okay. So many scores are close to zero and equating that they're very close to the mean of the means, the distance that you have to drive or travel is zero, close to zero. And there are only a few scores that are very large indicating that the distance you have to go is very far to get to them. So you can just remember Mahalanobis is like your Google Maps, right? You want things to be close to home base right? and some things are very far away. And we don't wanna use the people who are very far away because then we're not comparing similar participants. Okay. And so that pattern is not normally distributed, it's chi-square distributed. And we'll use this again in next week's lecture. So hold on to this idea that distance measures are chi-square distributed. But how do we know what I mean by very far away? Okay. Well, if we're using the chi-square as our distribution, right, with the other one, we use Z, the normal distribution and use z-scores. Now we just use chi-square. So what we'll do is we grab the cutoff score from a chi-square distribution. Chi-square distributions don't have one set of cutoff scores. Like a z-score, it's always just one set of cutoff scores. Like if it's 0.05, it's this. If it's 0.01, it's this. Okay. Chi-square, it's like, well, if I have one degree of freedom, it's this. If I have two degrees of freedom, it's that. So it depends on the number of degrees of freedom. Remember, we've talked about degrees of freedom being the number of scores that are free to vary and keep the same estimated parameter. Okay. Um, but in this, uh, that's generally based on participants, right? So with standard deviation, that's that n minus one thing at the denominator. However, for this, we're calculating our statistic, our mean of means, the centroid, based on the number of variables in the equation. Okay. And so the degrees of freedom in this particular outlier analysis is the number of input points. 
So if it's one column, it's one degree of freedom. Okay. If it's 10 columns, it's 10 degrees of freedom. Okay. And if it's one column, you just use these scores. And we'll use alpha as 0.001 to make sure we're focusing on our very strict criterion. And then we'll make R figure out that number for us. Because pulling out a table from a book, I forever in 100 years on my phone had like a link when you could do links as icons on iPhones um, as to a chi-square table online <laughs> because I had to look them up. But now that I'm using R, it's so great. I just tell R, hey, look that up for me. So that's what we'll do. Okay. And because we're saving multiple data sets, we can, uh, I just want to really reiterate at this point, why are we doing this, saving the data set over and over again, is now I can test no typos. This will look at the influence of, of any of these steps. Okay, I can test my no, my all rows or all columns data set, so my estimated missing data to see that distinction. Then from there, I can test my no outliers data to see what happened to my statistical test when I excluded outliers. So we're saving this one more time just to make sure we can, can, can if we want to, compare these steps. Yeah. Now, let's figure them out and eliminate them. Sorry. All of the numbers in the, all of the variables in this analysis have to be numbers. So we're going to have to exclude our categorical or our factor columns. Okay, it's just not really possible. There are ways we could include them but it's generally easier if you just exclude them. Okay. And we really should sometimes only analyze on data that's provided by participants. Okay. So if you put them into a categorical group, like they had no control over that, just exclude it. Okay. So this is potentially gonna eliminate anyone with any missing data because they won't receive a distance score. Okay. So if you're wanting to use this, um, and run like 10 different analyses, you might consider running this on the data for each analysis separately. So I just printed out all columns. So I'm not gonna use all rows here. I'm gonna use all columns because I know that row stuff, those people are gonna get excluded because they don't have a full set of data. And so I'm gonna use all columns. I could use all rows, but they would get excluded. And looking at the structure of the data, I probably wanna get rid of um, for this calculation, not delete, but just ignore for the calculation my sex and, and SES column. Okay. These are in a slightly different order now because of my like puzzle piecing them back together. So this is column um, number one, two, three, four. Okay. So for my Mahalanobis function down here, I'm going to exclude columns one and four, okay. or it won't run. <laughs> You'll be sad. <laughs> You'll get an error message. So the first argument here is the data set minus any columns that you need to exclude because they're categorical. The second argument is this call means argument. Okay. Now all columns does maybe have some missing data. So I'm gonna say NARM equals true. Okay. And we'll exclude, again, we'll use the same data set four times. You're only gonna see three on this slide. Okay, so make sure it's the same, one, same cut and pasted <laughs> on each one. So call means calculate the mean of all the means. And also it uses the covariance matrix. So it uses the relationship of these columns to each other. So the function here is Mahalanobis, data set, data set, data set, make sure they're all the same, and then leave the rest of the arguments alone, basically. Now that Mahal is not in the data set. It's a separate column that just calculates the distance score for every person. So these are just a whole bunch of distances. So we should have a whole bunch of things that are close to, close to zero and only a few things that are very far away. And now I have to come up with my cutoff score. So what am I deciding is very far away? So the function in R to, to grab a chi-square table, open it up and look at it, because I used to have to like pull out books and open them up to look at them, okay. is Q chi-square. The first number becomes the, 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 I lost my train of thought there. Like if we started chi-square, right, distribution is only one way. It's only positive. So if we start our little race car at zero, this is how far it can go before we decide that's too far, stop, come back. This is like your mom when you're rolling down the street on a bicycle, right? Nope, stop, that's too far, come back. Okay. 
what we mean by that is one minus alpha. Okay, so we're telling you the distance you're allowed to go. And so I did this as one minus 0.01 to help you understand why the number is 0.999. Okay, it's, it's how far am I allowing you to go? Well, I don't want you to hit that last point. Oh, 0.1%, 0.001. Okay. So we're allowed to go one minus alpha, okay, just like our type one error things that we've talked about, so um, one minus 0.05 often. Okay. Um, and it's also based on the number of input points. So this is part number four. I said, you'll paste this four times. So it's one, two, three, these should all match. And then over here under in columns, this is the fourth place that comes in. Okay, so this argument here is the, the kind of cutoff point. This is too far. And this argument is the degrees of freedom. Okay. Now it's not n minus one, and it has nothing to do with participants. It's the number of columns that went into the analysis. Okay. And so let's just print those out and look at what they are. So here it's 18 columns. So I've excluded sex and um, SES. And with 18 columns, P less, or alpha less than 0.01 is 42. Ish. Okay. So we can go 42 distance points okay, before it's too far. Well, how many people did that? Well, let's see. So I calculated a summary here of the number of, uh, of the Mahalanoba scores that are less than the cutoff. Okay. So there are two people who went too far, 118 participants that are less than the cutoff because we want them to be less than the cutoff because we don't want them to go too far. And five participants are gonna be excluded because they don't have enough data to be included in this analysis. Okay. And this is really why you wanna only run this outlier analysis on the data that is being used in the statistical analysis. Because if they have missing data on some other variable you're not interested in at that moment, you don't want to exclude them just because of that. So let's exclude them. So we're going to create a no out data set for no outliers, subsetting all columns where the Mahalanoba score is less than the cutoff. And so we want that direction, the less than sign, because that is where they haven't gone too far. Okay. And then I'm just calculating to show you what's happened here. So the dimensions of our all columns data set was we had 125 participants in 20 columns, and now we have 118 participants in 20 columns. So we lost seven, five due to missing data, two because they're outliers. And this is why it's really handy to have these as separate data sets, because okay, I can calculate this. When somebody said, well, how many people did you eliminate? Well, we eliminated seven, but two of them is because they're outliers, five of them because of missing data, bam. Okay, I have the answer for why it's less participants than the original data set. Okay, so that's how we'd exclude outliers, but we could run the analysis on no typos, all columns and no out and see the influence of those changes to our analysis. So let's summarize. For this week, we've learned the first half of data screening and that is the first like several steps. These are usually the ones that take the longest because the assumptions checks we can kind of usually kind of quickly run and look at all at once. Okay. allows us to deal with several different types of accuracy issues based on it being continuous or categorical. How to view, exclude, and impute missing data and my low-tech puzzle piece <laughs> paper solution to hopefully understanding on why we broke the data down the way we did. And how to calculate and exclude outliers if you're interested in doing that. So next week, we're going to cover assumptions and how we can check if our newly cleaned up data meets the requirements for a statistical test.